So um, I, I suspect most of you are um, familiar with vestibular disease, kind of vestibular disease is a, a problem in the balance system. And I wanted to start off with this series of images here because on many of the uh, online questions I, I get and many of the online forums I'm on, um, and, and quite frankly, just family, friends, etc. cetera, I, I often hear, hey, it's just vestibular disease, it will get better on its own. And these are two different patients that look very, very similar. And one of them has a condition that they're going to get better from. And one of them has a condition that without treatment um, would certainly die. Um, so they can, you can tell they look very, very similar. Um, so one will get better on its own and the other is gonna die without treatment. Um, are you able to tell the difference just by looking? And that's really going to be one of the take home messages today um, is, that, is that you can't tell just by looking at them. So um, the vestibular system, when the nervous system is working fine, um, you know, we, we move around well, we're coordinated, we're able to go where we want to go, we're not falling or anything like that. But when the balance system isn't working, and this is actually uh, the little dog that was on the, the left side of the screen previously, um, we, we get signs of vestibular disease. What are the signs of vestibular disease? Well, the hallmark is a head tilt. So a head tilt is that when the head is cocked to one side so that one ear is closer to the ground than the other, as opposed to a head turn in which the ears and the eyes are on the same level but they're turning as opposed to a head tilt is where one ear or one eye is lower to the ground than the other. Um, that's one of the questions that, that somebody brought up and we will get to that question. Another sign of vestibular disease is rolling. Um, so this dog is, its head is tilted so far to the left and its vestibular system is so, um, so much trying to, to go to the left that we actually alligator roll um, over and over here. So this is another sign of vestibular disease. Another sign of vestibular disease is strabismus or abnormal eye position. What we're looking at here is I'm taking a picture at this dog um, and I'm kind of aiming the camera straight at the ground and his nose is pointed straight at the sky. And you can see the right eye is right where it should be, whereas the left eye is deviated downward or towards the towards the dog's nose so that you can see the white of the sclera here. I hope you can all appreciate that. That's called strabismus. And then the next symptom of vestibular disease is called nystagmus. Nystagmus means involuntary eye movements. And um, in jerk nystagmus, it's characterized by a slow movement in one direction, what we call the slow phase, and a rapid jerk in the opposite direction, what we call the fast phase. So this dog has <laughs> nystagmus that is um, vertical, so it's going up and down, and the fast phase is down. The vestibular system is the part of the neurological system responsible for maintaining balance and head position. And we can um, anatomically and um, just generally think about the vestibular system as two parts. The two parts of the peripheral vestibular system, which is the part of the balance system outside of the brain, meaning the inner ear, and the central vestibular system, which is the portion of the vestibular system inside of the brain, specifically uh, the brain stem or the, the medulla oblongata and the cerebellum. So the vestibular system is a bilateral system. So it's functioning on both sides of the body. And it's, it's basically a, a balance um, between those two sides. In general, the, the vestibular system gives input to the extensors of the limbs on the same side of the body. So when Sir William here leans to the right, his vestibular system senses that and increases the tone on that right side to keep him upright. But if we have a problem in one side of the vestibular system, we have a relative decrease in the extensor tone on that side. And that causes 
symptoms of head tilt towards the side or leaning, rolling, um, and, and falling to the side. So again, um, which one of these gets better? You can see that they're very, very similar. They're both rolling. They're both small, uh, dark-coated dogs. And that is the crux of the matter. I mean, whenever we meet a dog, um, we're trying to figure out, well, can we make it better? What's the likelihood of getting better? Um, also called the prognosis. But the prognosis is really based on what the cause is. So certain causes are very, very fixable where other causes are, are not as fixable. So um, prognosis or answering that all important question of can we make this better depends on the diagnosis. We only come to a diagnosis um, by testing or most frequently we come to a diagnosis by testing, but we can only do the appropriate tests if we've come up with a what we call a differential diagnosis or a, an appropriate list of possible causes. That depends on a thorough examination and an accurate localization. So when we say localization, we're talking about saying specifically where in the body or where in the nervous system the problem is. And usually before we get to any of those things, we start off with a history. So um, if we go in the opposite order, basically we start with a history that gives us the exam, excuse me, we start off with the history, um, then we move to the exam and localization. That gives us a list of possible causes. Using that list of possible causes, we can come up with an intelligent way of systematically testing for those possible causes to reach a diagnosis so that we can treat and tell the pet owner what the likelihood of getting better is. So history, things that we're really interested in, especially for dogs with vestibular disease, is what's the age, what's the breed, what we call the signalment, because certain ages and breeds we see certain conditions in that we don't see other ones in. Um, for example, uh, old dog vestibular disease, we classically see it in older dogs. Similarly, brain tumors and strokes, we classically see in older dogs, whereas things like inflammation of the brain, encephalitis, tends to happen in smaller breed dogs and tends to happen um, sort of in young, young adults, young to middle age. Um, things like congenital malformations and uh, polyps tend to happen in younger animals, polyps specifically in cats. So that's where signament becomes so important. One of our questions will be how long have symptoms been going on? Did they come on suddenly um, or have they been more slow? Have they been progressing? Have they been getting worse? Have they been getting better? Um, are there good days and bad days? or has it been somewhat static over the last uh, few days? What treatments have been tried and what's the response? And that may help us um, not necessarily know what the cause is, but help us say what the likely causes are and put them in a uh, more accurate order. Other medical history, meaning um, do we have other conditions? Do we have Things like ear infections or skin problems frequently have been shaking at the head, scratching at the ears. Um, do we have other medical conditions such as heart problems or kidney problems, et cetera? And then any medications that we've been receiving because certain medications can cause different types of vestibular disease. Moving on to the examination. Our examination always starts off with a complete physical examination. So we're not just looking at the nervous system, but we're looking at the, the skin, we're listening to the heart and lungs, we're palpating the belly, we're watching the dog walk if he's able to, he or she is able to, we're doing an orthopedic exam, um, we're checking the lymph nodes, etc. Specifically, when we do a neurological examination, we're evaluating a few different things. Um, we're checking the level of consciousness or level of alertness we're examining the cranial nerves. So there are 12 nerves that supply the, um, the head, or excuse me, that originates in, in the brain and supply the head and other structures within the body. And um, cranial nerve eight is the balance nerve, and that is one of the cranial nerves. But we can also see other abnormalities in cranial nerves that may help us determine, is it more likely to be 
affecting the central vestibular system or the peripheral vestibular system. Similarly, we evaluate the gait and posture. Um, you've seen some of that already with the wide base stance, the listing to the side, the falling to the side, and sometimes rolling. Postural reactions are very important for us to be assessing in animals that have balance problems. These are things that, um, where we flip the paw over from its normal position to an abnormal position, and the normal response is for the pet to replace the foot. Um, abnormalities in postural reactions make us more concerned about central vestibular disease, but there are a handful of things to be thinking of. Sometimes dogs that are just really off balance, sometimes it's hard um, for us to truly assess, do they have normal postural reactions or not? Just every time you pick them up, they start rolling or flailing. And then sometimes dogs can have other problems that cause them to have postural reaction deficits. So um, we interpret that in light of the rest of the examination. And then the spinal reflexes, which for the majority of these are, are normal for the majority of dogs with, with balance problems. With level of alertness, um, we expect the level of, of consciousness to be normal in peripheral vestibular disease. Sometimes dogs can be very anxious, especially when things first start, um, but we don't expect a decrease in level of consciousness in peripheral vestibular disease, but it may be decreased in central vestibular disease. So not always, you can have a normal level of alertness, but if the pet is not responsive or obtunded or stuporous or just has a decreased level of consciousness. Those are things that make veterinarians suspect um, central vestibular disease over peripheral. The next thing we look at is cranial nerves. Um, so a head tilt, nystagmus and strabismus, um, we expect that in vestibular disease. So whether it's central or peripheral, but we are looking for other cranial nerve abnormalities that may suggest a central vestibular disease. Facial droop or facial nerve paralysis is caused by a problem affecting cranial nerve seven. And we just said that uh, the vestibular nerve is cranial nerve eight. So they're right next to each other. So sometimes we can have facial nerve paralysis on the same side and that doesn't necessarily tell us whether something is central versus peripheral. But when we have things like um, atrophy of the one side of the tongue or atrophy of one side of the head or decreased sensation on one side of the head or an absent menace response on the same side as the head tilt, those are all things that make us more concerned about central vestibular disease. Again, nystagmus is um, jerking movements of the eyes and we characterize them in the direction. So is it going side to side or horizontal? Is it more rotational or rotary? Or are they going up and down? We call vertical nystagmus. We also characterize it by the fast phase. So in horizontal, we might say horizontal nystagmus with the fast phase to the right. Um, this is this is my right over here, so I'm not sure what, what's happening with the camera, just in case it looks like I'm doing left there. But Or it can be down, um, fast phase down, fast phase up, fast phase left, etc. So we, again, characterize nystagmus in the direction um, as well as the direction of the fast phase. We can have horizontal nystagmus or rotary nystagmus in either peripheral vestibular disease or in central vestibular disease. But when we see vertical nystagmus, that's something that um, strongly suggests that this is a case of central vestibular disease. So um, said another way, central vestibular disease can have any of these, horizontal, vertical, or rotary. But if we see um, vertical nystagmus, we do not expect that in peripheral vestibular disease, and that strongly suggests central vestibular disease. We talked a little bit about cranial nerve abnormalities that we can see with um, vestibular disease. In the upper left here, we can see this dog has atrophy of one side of the tongue. So the left side of the tongue um, is 
is nice and well muscled, um, whereas we can see on the right side here, we're starting to see some atrophy. Um, this dog had central vestibular disease. Uh, um, she had an absent menace on the right side and um, a head tilt to the right. This dog has facial nerve paralysis, so you can see that there's a facial droop on the left side that we don't appreciate on the right. Facial nerve paralysis is due to a problem affecting the facial nerve or a cranial nerve seven. Um, so we can see that in central, but we can also see it in peripheral vestibular disease. So presence of cranial nerve seven abnormalities does not necessarily tell us in addition to the vestibular disease, is this central or peripheral vestibular disease? This little dog here has atrophy of the muscles of chewing on the right side of the face. Um, so you can appreciate here that it's somewhat dished out and a very prominent cheekbone. Um, we also have um, ptosis or droopiness of the right eye. So this is something that's affecting cranial nerve five or the trigeminal nerve. Again, something that we would not expect with peripheral vestibular disease. So this is a strong indication when we see this along with vestibular disease, um, it's a strong indication for central disease. And then um, this dog is showing Horner's syndrome. So if we look at the pupils here, Horner's syndrome is a decrease in the sympathetic innervation to the eye. And normally the sympathetic uh, system does things like dilates the eye. And um, uh, when, you're, when you're scared, when you're in that flight or fight response, um, those sorts of things happen. So when we have a problem in the vestibular, excuse me, when we have a problem in the sympathetic innervation to the eye, we'll see things like droopiness, elevation of the third eyelid or the nictitating membrane, and an isochoria with a smaller pupil on that side compared to the other pupil. When we see a problem in the sympathetic innervation to the eye, that is more suggestive of a problem affecting the peripheral vestibular system because the sympathetic innervation to the eye travels through the middle ear canal. So problems affecting the inner ear um, can the middle and inner ear can also cause Horner syndrome. Again, postural reactions should be normal in dogs and cats with peripheral vestibular disease, but might be abnormal in animals with central vestibular disease. So then that brings us, so we've gone from history to examination and, um, and, and now we're localizing the, the problem. And I'm only going to talk about peripheral versus central. There are um, bilateral peripheral and central paradoxical um, localizations, but today we're only going to talk about unilateral peripheral and uh, central vestibular disease and differentiating the two. In unilateral peripheral vestibular disease, um, we have that vestibular quality ataxia, so that wide base stance, leaning, falling, listing to one, sort, to one side. The head tilt is toward the side of the problem, and we can have horizontal or rotary nystagmus. Excuse me. Um, we do not expect to have vertical nystagmus, and that horizontal or rotary nystagmus has the fast phase in the opposite direction of the head tilt. Postural reactions or those placing, um, those placing reactions should be normal, and spinal reflexes are normal. And we don't expect other cranial nerve abnormalities with the exception of facial nerve paralysis is possible. So when we look at this dog's uh, video here, we see that the head is tilted to the right. And right there is kind of the, the best part of the video at the very beginning of where it resets. We can see that there's horizontal nystagmus that's kind of jerking towards the left. So we have uh, an alert dog, head tilt toward the right, horizontal nystagmus with the fast face to the left. Um, the rest of the examination, postural reactions, cranial nerves, and, uh, and reflexes were all normal. Whereas central localization, we can still have that vestibular quality ataxia. So those animals still can lean, fall, list to one side, but the head tilt can be toward or away from the side of the, where the abnormality is in the vestibular system. 
we can have horizontal nystagmus, we can have rotary nystagmus, um, but we can also have vertical nystagmus, which is something that we don't expect in peripheral vestibular disease. So what we're looking at here in this video, this dog has vertical nystagmus. So when I lift the nose to the sky, we kind of see a beat kind of down. This dog was very um, mentally inappropriate, it's very dull. And she also had postural reaction deficits. So when we flipped her paws over, all four of them just stayed buckled over. Um, she did not have other cranial nerve abnormalities, but we can see other cranial nerve abnormalities in central vestibular disease, um, specifically decreased sensation of the face, um, atrophy of the tongue, and uh, sometimes atrophy of the muscles of chewing. There we are with our postural reactions. So to, to summarize, um, localizing whether it's a peripheral disease or a central disease. And again, this is one of the most important things that um, we need to determine is, is it peripheral or central? Because that affects the rest of that sort of flow chart that we talked about. That affects what the list of possible causes is um, to an extent it, it affects the tests that we recommend and it affects the treatment and the prognosis. So this is one of the most important things is for us to try and determine, is it a peripheral or a central problem? In peripheral vestibular disease, the head tilt is towards the side of the problem, but in central, it can be toward or away. Again, we expect nystagmus in patients with vestibular disease. Um, and if it's horizontal or rotary, that really doesn't help us differentiate peripheral from central. But if we see something like vertical nystagmus, that's something that strongly suggests central because we don't expect it in peripheral vestibular disease. Um, the fast phase is typically away from the side of the lesion, whereas in central, it's uh, toward either side. We don't expect postural reaction deficits in peripheral vestibular disease where we may see them in central. And if we see them in central, it's typically on the same side as the problem. We don't expect other cranial nerve deficits in peripheral vestibular disease other than cranial nerve seven or Horner syndrome, um, but it is possible in central, especially cranial nerve five, seven, and 12. And we expect to be alert or sometimes even anxious in dogs with peripheral vestibular disease whereas we may have changes in level of consciousness in central vestibular disease. What are the possible causes? So again, now we've gone from history, um, exam, localization, and now that we've localized it as peripheral or central, we come up with a list of possible causes. And the more common things that we see affecting the peripheral vestibular system are things like deep ear infections. So, so inner ear infections, not necessarily exter external ear infections, but deep middle and inner ear infections. Um, old dog or geriatric or idiopathic vestibular disease. Um, ear cleaning can sometimes cause peripheral vestibular disease. Tumors, polyps. Um, occasionally we see hypothyroidism associated with peripheral or central vestibular disease. Um, and trauma occasionally can cause peripheral or central vestibular disease. With regards to central vestibular disease, um, we see things like strokes and meningitis and encephalitis. Brain tumors can cause central vestibular disease. Um, infections um, of the brain, extension of that deep ear infection can sometimes cause central vestibular signs, and then certain toxicities such as metronidazole. So in general, you can see if we've localized a pet as having a central vestibular problem, the list of possible causes in general is much more serious or much more worrisome than things that affect the peripheral vestibular system. And that's why it's so important when dogs are showing, dogs and cats are showing signs of vestibular disease for us to evaluate them to try and deter determine that. So what are the tests that we recommend for pets with vestibular disease? Um, for both central and peripheral, there's plenty of overlap here. Um, 
so some of these things we, we don't do for all, um, but there is a lot of overlap. So we're gonna talk about them together. Um, for both central and peripheral, we often recommend blood tests, um, meaning a, a complete blood counter, a CBC, a chemistry panel, um, many times at least a T4, um, if not a full thyroid profile are indicated, whether we're talking central or peripheral. I always recommend x-rays of the chest to evaluate the heart and the lungs, whether we are moving on to an MRI and anesthesia or whether we're screening for underlying causes of stroke um, or whether we're looking for things like uh, neoplasia or cancer. Same rationale for x-rays of the belly. And I routinely always check a blood pressure on pets with vestibular disease. From there, let's back up. So most of the time we can't have a full diagnosis and know for certain what the cause is just by doing that first tier of tests. So for pretty much all animals with vestibular disease, there is an indication to proceed with anesthesia and an MRI of the head. MRI of the head is going to give us a picture of the inner ear, the middle ear, and the central portions of the vestibular system, the brain stem. Um, and those are all just things that there really is not another good way of seeing. So x-rays are not good for seeing that, um, ultrasounds, and even CAT scans are not very good for looking at the vestibular system. Um, we'll show you a, uh, an example of that a little bit later. Spinal taps are often indicated. Um, we do that to look for uh, certain types of cancer, sometimes infection, um, but most frequently we're looking for evidence of autoimmune inflammation or encephalitis or meningitis. And in certain cases, we recommend infectious disease testing, whether that's on blood, um, or whether that's on uh, CSF. So again, the list of possible causes, um, we've got things like ear infections, old dog, vestibular ear cleaning, tumors, et cetera, on the left. Um, on the right under central, we have the more concerning things. So what's our approach in trying to figure this out um, is by doing tests. We do it in a systematic way where we start off with the less invasive, less expensive tests first. And a lot of that is just history and exam. And we can cross off certain things from our list just by asking questions and doing a thorough physical um, examination. You know, does this dog uh, have history of ear infection or history of trauma? Is, you know, did you recently clean the ears? Um, are you giving any medications such as metronidazole, et cetera? So a lot of these things can be crossed off our list simply by asking questions, but it needs to be on our, our radar in order to be asking those questions. From there, we move on to some tests. So um, blood tests can help rule out or make hypothyroidism as a cause less likely. And then really, an MRI is plus or minus spinal tap is necessary to rule out the vast majority of cases, um, excuse me, the vast majority of causes such as strokes, encephalitis, brain tumors, um, infection, inner ear infections and middle ear infections. Those are things that we can't necessarily see from the outside. Um, so we do need an MRI in order to see that. Um, Certain tumors and certain polyps um, we can see on a physical examination, but sometimes we do need advanced imaging. So the last one here, which is one of the more common ones that happens is old dog or idiopathic vestibular disease. Really the only way that we can diagnose that is by ruling everything else out by doing these tests. Um, we, we cross off all of the other possible causes and at that point, we're left with idiopathic or old dog vestibular disease. So it's a diagnosis of exclusion. Um, sure, in certain situations, it's not wrong to assume that's what it is, um, but there are plenty of times where assuming that that's what it is, is the wrong thing um, because we might have one of these other things as the cause.
So quickly, we're just going to look at a couple different cases um, that will illustrate different diseases. Um, this is Molly. Uh, she's 11 years old. She had an acute onset of inability to walk. You can see she has a head tilt to the left and she has horizontal nystagmus with the fast face to the right. Um, when we first met her, if we picked her up to try and check postural reactions, she actually just rolled too much. Um, this is kind of the day after, where now when we lift her up um, and check her postural reactions, she does replace them. Uh, the rest of her cranial nerves were normal. So she has idiopathic vestibular disease. Um, we did full testing of um, blood tests, check, chest x-rays, belly, belly x-rays, an MRI of the head was normal and a spinal tap was normal. So we diagnosed that by excluding everything else, but also having it on our radar just based on the age, um, the breed, the acute onset, and the peripheral localization. Usually this improves within uh, 24 to 72 hours, does not necessarily resolve in that time, but we're usually markedly improved. Treatment is supportive care. Um, it's not wrong to give things like Serenia and Meclizine, um, but the prognosis is excellent. So many times these dogs present, they're older dogs, it's very dramatic, they're rolling, and the knee-jerk reaction is, hey, this is something bad, and we need to euthanize this pet. Um, while my recommendation is still an MRI to rule out other things like a stroke, uh, or a tumor or an ear infection, et cetera. Um, if all you can do for this sort of pet is give it time, many times they will get better. So um, the prognosis tends to be very, very good for old dog vestibular disease. This is a Cocker Spaniel. We saw her earlier. Um, she has this head tilt to the right. She has the uh, sort of listing to the right. She has the head tilt to the right and the nystagmus with the fast phase horizontal to the left. Postural reactions were normal. So we localized her with peripheral vestibular disease and our list of possible causes was things like old dog vestibular disease. She's a little on the young side. Um, ear infections, that's something common in Cocker Spaniels. Um, we were worried about uh, things like hypothyroidism, tumors of the ear, uh, things like that were all possible. So we did an MRI and that showed um, infection of the, the middle ear. This is actually a CAT scan um, that shows what you can see on a CAT scan. So sometimes you can see a narrowed external ear canal um, these are the bones of the middle ear. And you can see in the right middle ear, there is uh, material there. And the ear canal is stenotic or narrowed. Um, but look here at the, at the brain. We can't see that very well. It kind of is the same shade of gray as muscle and the rest of the brain. Um, whereas this, this is a different dog, we can see a lot more in the brain. So if there were a brain tumor or a stroke or encephalitis, we would have totally missed it on the CAT scan, whereas we would find it on the MRI. We have a much better chance of finding it on the MRI. So um, for anyone that's ever met me, um, one of my big things is CT is insensitive and nonspecific for pretty much any cause in the brain, especially when we're talking about the vestibular system. And we'll talk about the, the, the reason for that in a, another case coming up. So otitis media interna is the most common cause of peripheral vestibular disease. Um, it is a peripheral localization typically. Um, it might be acute or chronic of signs. Important is the external ear canal can be completely normal. So just by looking in the ear canal and it looking clear does not rule out an ear infection and vice versa. Having a very dirty external ear canal does not necessarily mean that that's the cause of vestibular disease. Bacteria can come from various places. Um, we may also see Horner syndrome or facial nerve paralysis. And the treatment is um, 
Many times we can start off with just antibiotics, but they're long-term antibiotics, typically for at least six to eight weeks or treatment until after resolution of signs for a couple weeks. Ideally, those antibiotics are chosen based off of culture. Sometimes that can be based off of uh, a myringotomy. Occasionally we need to um, do a deep ear flush or surgery, a bulla osteotomy, um, and sometimes a total ear canal ablation to remove the, uh, the deep ear infection. Couple more cases for you. Uh, this is another dog that has a very similar head tilt and similar gait to all of the other patients that we've seen. We can see that she has a head tilt to the right. Um, she's listing and falling to the right. Sometimes she even does a kind of tight circle. Um, she has horizontal to almost rotary nystagmus with the fast face to the left. Her postural reactions were normal. And so we localized her as being peripheral vestibular. Our list of differentials were things like old dog vestibular disease, um, ear infections, tumors, polyps, uh, deep ear cleanings, et cetera. Um, and the owner elected for an MRI and we found this tumor of the ear canal. You can see here, this image on the left is before contrast and this image on the right is after contrast. If we look at the left ear canal, you can see that it's nice and, and open, this dark area here, whereas the right one, that's completely obliterated and it's just um, you know, three times as wide as it could should be, just kind of irregular and contrast enhancing. So this dog had a tumor of its ear canal that was causing its peripheral vestibular disease. So perfect example of the signs fit and the signalment fits. It was an acute onset. It's an older dog. Gosh, that could be old dog vestibular disease, but it was something much more sinister that the sooner we find it and treat it, the better chances this pet had. Um, this is a five-year-old Yorkie that we can see has a head tilt to the right. The head kind of wobbles just a little bit when we check postural reactions, we're kind of slow on that left, but it's completely absent in the right side of the body. We'll look at that one more time. Slow on the left, but completely absent on the right. And then we have strabismus here in the right eye and you can't appreciate very well, but this dog also had vertical nystagmus. So we diagnosed as having vestibular disease because of a head tilt, um, nystagmus and strabismus. Our examination with this sort of bobbling of the head and the absent postural reactions made us much more worried about central vestibular disease. So our list of possible causes shifted to things more like strokes and encephalitis and tumors and metronidazole toxicity and uh, that list that we talked about for central vestibular disease. Um, highest on our list just based on age and breed was encephalitis and we did an MRI. Um, the MRI showed classic evidence of inflammation of the brain. So this is an MRI of Stoldi's brain kind of at the front part and this is more towards the back part of the brain. And we can see these bright spots on the inside of the brain here, as well as the bright spots on the picture on the left that kind of follow the white matter of the brain. And these are just classic changes that we see with encephalitis. We also did a spinal tap, which was supportive of encephalitis. So um, Going a little bit further on the idea of a CT scan, this is not STOLI, um, but just illustrating why CT scans are not good for looking at the balance system, the vestibular system. We can see here in this dog, an artifact called, called a beam hardening artifact, where the CAT scan mismatches or mismaps what this should look like here and makes it very dark. So we can't actually see the abnormality on a CAT scan. Um, we would have totally missed the diagnosis. 
had we done a CAT scan. So again, we shouldn't be CTing brains, um, whether we're talking about seizures, but in this particular conversation, um, certainly not in vestibular disease. Meningoencephalitis in dogs is very common. We see it in certain breeds, Yorkies, Maltese, Chihuahuas. It's typically autoimmune. So encephalitis can be caused by infections, but it's much more common to be autoimmune, especially in these sorts of breeds. Diagnosis requires an MRI and a spinal tap. Um, just the only way that we can truly see this is by doing those tests and working through that. Um, sure, we can suspect it based on age, breed, symptoms, um, and examination, but the only way we can truly diagnose it is with an MRI and a spinal tap. Treatment involves medications to suppress the overactive immune system that are typically lifelong or at least long-term. And the prognosis is guarded, meaning some dogs do very well um, with early aggressive treatment. Um, some dogs, despite early aggressive treatment, have good days and bad days and wax and wane. Um, but about greater than 20% of dogs will actually die of this condition, especially if we don't diagnose it soon enough. And this is another reason when I, I, I see online of, you know, hey, just give it a few days. Um, it, it worries me in that some dogs can actually get much worse in those few days. I believe this is our last or second to last case. Um, Mako is a five-year-old outdoor kitty. What we can see in Mako's exam here, um, he can't get up and walk. He has a just sort of a head bobble there and he has a head tilt to the left. His postural reactions are okay on the right side, but absent on the left. And he has vertical nystagmus. So you can see his eyes are sort of jerking up and down um, with the fast phase down. So we localized Mako as having central vestibular disease. So our list of worries in central vestibular disease are things, again, strokes, tumors, infection, inflammation, um, certain medications, et cetera. We did blood tests and chest x-rays and belly x-rays and that did not show a cause for Mako. So we did an MRI that showed multiple different abnormalities that look just like this one here. So what we're looking at is Mako sort of from the top, his nose would be pointed at the, the top of the screen. This is his neck here. This is his brain. This is his cerebellum and we see this ring um, or contrast enhancing ring in the cerebellum. And there are a couple smaller ones throughout the brain. We did a spinal tap and we also did infectious disease testing that showed um, that he had been recently exposed to toxoplasma. So um, his diagnosis with was uh, a brain infection due to toxoplasma, and that was the cause of his central vestibular disease. I was wrong. Two more cases. Um, Rocky, the thing that's a little different about Rocky that we haven't seen so far, we still see that there's the head tilt to the left and the wide-based stance, and he lifts to the left, but he's really high stepping in that right front leg. Um, and that's just something that suggests central vestibular disease because it's affecting the cerebellum. The cerebellum its job is to refine movements. And when we have a problem affecting the cerebellum, we see these high stepping jerky or bursty movements. So we localized Rocky's having a central vestibular problem. Um, again, same thing, blood work, x-rays, blood pressure. Um, but when that does not give us an answer, an MRI is what's required in order for us to know, is it something like a stroke? Is it a brain tumor? Is it... Um, infection, encephalitis, et cetera. We did an MRI that showed a, a brain tumor um, pressing on the, the cerebellum. Treatment for this particular dog was radiation. Uh, another dog with a, a brain tumor. 
after treatment, you can see that the dog's much better. I'm sorry that I sort of breezed through that, but I know we're kind of uh, short on time. Similar to Rocky, we have a dog that has a head tilt in one direction and high stepping on the opposite side. Um, so this dog also has a problem affecting the central vestibular system. Um, you can see right there that he buckles over in that left front limb or has a postural reaction deficit. So those are all things that make us think central vestibular disease. Same thought process as before. We're worried about things like strokes, brain tumors, encephalitis, et cetera. Um, particularly in greyhounds, we're worried about strokes. They're just somewhat more prone to strokes than other breeds. So we did an MRI that showed a uh, classic stroke affecting the cerebellum. That's what this bright, um, somewhat wedge-shaped or triangular-shaped abnormality in the cerebellum here is. And we can do a specific type of sequence with MRI that shows uh, pretty convincingly that it's an ischemic infarct where there isn't blood supply to that area of the brain where it's bright here and dark there. And again, that's something that just a CAT scan would never show. Strokes or cerebrovascular disease um, is, is more common than, than we used to think. Um, we diagnose it relatively frequently. And um, sometimes there's an underlying cause, whether that cause is high blood pressure, kidney disease, Cushing's disease, um, heart problems, cancer elsewhere in the body, et cetera. Um, but about half the time, we can't find an underlying cause. Despite an exhaustive search, we don't find another cause. Um, we, whenever we have a dog with a stroke, we look for all of these things. So um, other blood tests, blood pressure, um, belly ultrasounds, chest x-rays, if we haven't done that already. Um, treatment depends on treating the underlying cause of the stroke. And um, most of the time it's just supportive care for the stroke because many times dogs will get better after a stroke. Prognosis really depends on if we find an underlying cause or not. Many dogs and cats will get better from strokes. Um, and I find that they tend to get better and stay better if we don't find an underlying cause. Whereas if we do find an underlying cause, while that's exciting, we found the cause, we found something to treat to make it less likely that it happens again. In my experience, we tend to see those dogs have uh, strokes in the future. So thank you for your attention during the, uh, the presentation portion. Um, we had a, a fair amount of questions that were submitted and we'll go through them. Hopefully I answered a lot of those um, already in the presentation. Um, the first question is, is geriatric old dog vestibular disease peripheral or central in origin? And um, what are the, the figures to differentiate? Um, and th this is kind of the, the whole meat of, of this presentation is determining peripheral versus central. Um, old dog vestibular disease is typically peripheral localization. So um, said another way, if I have an old dog with a sudden onset of vestibular signs, at that point, I, I can't from that information say, is it um, old dog or, or not, old dog vestibular disease, or is it something more worrisome? But now that I've done my examination, and if I've localized as central, all of a sudden, old dog vestibular disease has pretty much dropped off my worry list, and I'm much more worried about things like strokes and brain tumors and encephalitis. Not localizing central does not necessarily um, make it that it can't be a brain tumor or stroke still. Um, but to specifically answer the question, and I apologize, I got off on a little bit of a tangent there. Old dog vestibular disease as a rule is um, a peripheral localization. Um, said another way, if you see central signs, we shouldn't be thinking things like old dog vestibular disease that's just gonna get better in you know, two or three days. What are the figures to differentiate? That's that, um, that uh, form that we had here. Um, sorry, that chart that we have here. Again, differentiating peripheral versus central. Head tilt is always toward the side of the lesion where it can be um, toward or away. 
We can have horizontal or rotary nystagmus in either peripheral or central, but if we have vertical nystagmus, we're thinking central, and all of a sudden things like old dog vestibular disease aren't, uh, aren't on our worry list anymore. Again, we don't expect postural reaction deficits in peripheral, whereas we can see it in central. We don't expect other cranial nerve deficits other than seven, um, which is that facial droop in peripheral, whereas we can see other ones in central. Um, very much related to the last question is, is it necessary to go for an MRI in geriatric patients? Um, and I guess the word necessary, is it necessary? Um, no, I mean, whenever we meet a pet, you know, it's, it's not just a, a one size fits all cookie cutter. We take lots of things into consideration. Um, you know, how long has it been going on? But we also take into consideration their ability to um, tolerate anesthesia, as well as the owner's willingness and understanding um, to proceed with tests. So we certainly meet people that say, I just don't want to do an MRI. And um, it's not wrong to do that. But most of the time, our recommendation is an MRI, because the only way for us to know that it's idiopathic old dog vestibular disease is by ruling everything else out. So um, is it necessary for a, a geriatric patient? Not necessarily. But um, the only way that we can rule out other things that happen in older dogs that can cause the exact same symptoms, such as tumors, which we want to know about that as soon as possible, strokes, which we want to know about as soon as possible, um, deep ear infections, et cetera. Um, the only way for us to do that is by doing an MRI. So typically, we do recommend an MRI for pretty much every patient with vestibular disease, um, but specifically for your question, uh, yes, for geriatric patients. Um, can you describe the different types, meaning directions of nystagmus and how it can aid in localization? Um, great question. So again, the, let me get both of them running here. Um, again, nystagmus is those abnormal involuntary jerks of, of the eyes. Um, and we characterize it in two ways. Um, the first is the direction. Is it horizontal? Is it vertical? Or is it rotary? And we can see horizontal and, um, excuse me, and we can see horizontal and rotary nystagmus, whether we're talking about central or peripheral. But if we see vertical nystagmus, we don't expect that in peripheral. And if we see central, excuse me, if we see vertical nystagmus, we automatically go straight to being much more worried about central vestibular disease. I really butchered that, sorry. Um, I, I hope that makes sense. I'll say it one more time. So um, to, to answer the question of um, describing different types or directions of nystagmus and how it can aid in localization. In general, we have two types of nystagmus. Um, horizontal, wow. In general, we describe it in two ways. Um, the direction, meaning is it horizontal, is it rotary, is it um, vertical? and we describe the fast phase as the fast phase down, is the fast phase left, right, et cetera. We do not expect vertical nystagmus in peripheral vestibular disease. So if we see vertical nystagmus, we automatically think central, which makes us much more worried about that list of causes such as strokes, tumors, et cetera. Finding horizontal or rotary nystagmus does not tell us that it's peripheral. We can also see horizontal and rotary nystagmus in central. So that by itself is not a good differentiator between central and peripheral. Um, but seeing vertical is, and then other things like postural reaction deficits, changes in mentation, other cranial nerve abnormalities, and cerebellar signs.
Um, can you clarify how head tilt and circling relate, meaning um, of the direction of the head tilt or the direction of the circling? So um, when I think of circling, I think of, again, there isn't a head tilt. Our ears and our eyes are on the same plane as each other, and we're just turning to one side and kind of walking around the room. And that typically means a problem affecting the forebrain or not the vestibular system. Um, whereas head tilt, where we've got ears cocked to the head cocked to one side so that the e one ear is lower than the other or one eye is lower than the other, that does suggest vestibular disease. Occasionally, we will have a pet that does have vestibular disease and circles. So this dog does have a head tilt um, and is listing to, to the right. And they tend to do smaller circles um, or tighter circles, but we also see other signs of vestibular disease. We see nystagmus, we see head tilt, et cetera. Um, whereas the cat is just sort of, um, we don't see a head tilt, we don't see abnormal nystagmus, but we compulsively uh, turn to the right here. We have a tendency to turn to the right. Again, the cat is more suggestive of a um, forebrain problem where dogs and cats tend to circle in the direction of the, um, of the lesion. Whereas the vestibular dogs, most of the time they have a head tilt and nystagmus, but sometimes they circle. The circles tend to be tighter um, and they are usually circling um, in the direction of the head tilt, but not always as this dog does here. He kind of um, circles left and then circles right. What is the success rate in patients with vestibular syndrome? Um, that really comes down to the, the underlying cause. So. Vestibular syndrome, syndrome just means, you know, we've got a head tilt and we're off balance and nystagmus. So success rate for a dog with old dog vestibular or idiopathic vestibular, the prognosis is excellent. Whereas the success rate for a pet with vestibular syndrome secondary to a brain tumor is much worse. Um, the success rate for patients with vestibular syndrome due to say metronidazole toxicity is fantastic. We take away the drug and the pet gets better. Um, whereas the success rate for patients with vestibular syndrome secondary to encephalitis is much worse. So it really comes down to finding the underlying cause. And that's how we best determine the treatment, but also am, am, are able to tell the, the pet owner, uh, the pet parent, the likelihood or the success rate of their pet getting better. So that's why tests are so important um, and an evaluation is so important so that we can know what's going on, so that we can have a diagnosis and uh, so that we can give a treatment and prognosis. A couple more questions. Um, is it really imbalance of the crystals in the inner ear? Um, I assume you're saying specifically for um, idiopathic vestibular syndrome and do they spontaneously shift back? Um, technically speaking, we truly don't know. The, the theory is that um, it is an imbalance of the, the osmolality of the fluid in the inner ear. So um, I, I didn't spend a whole lot of time on, on the physiology of, of things, but again, you've got receptors in both inner ears and those receptors are housed in a, a fluid um, set of tubules and canals. And um, the theory of why idiopathic vestibular syndrome in dogs and cats happen is because of a, a disturbance in that fluid. Um, and, but technically speaking, we, we, we don't know or we can't prove, prove it. Is it the, the crystals in the inner ear? And um, do they get better because it spontaneously just shifts back into position? Um, and then this one, um, I have a male dog, four years old, who was hit by a car on Monday. I'm sorry you're going through this. Um, after initial treatment, he has lateral nystagmus or um, horizontal nystagmus in both eyes. 
and this position of the head. Thank you for sending a video. Um, videos are super duper helpful. So you can see your, your puppy um, has a head tilt to the right. Um, and you had said uh, horizontal nystagmus. Um, pr presumably it's, it's to the left. Um, so it depends on, on other things of what the postural reactions are like in other cranial nerve. Um, your, your puppy certainly seems alert. So to me with head trauma, um, oh, I, I just saw the little cat in the background there. Um, to me with head trauma, you can have vestibular signs. So those um, fluid filled canals and ducts that I just talked about, they're actually housed in, uh, a, in the bones of the skull, the, the petrous temporal bone, which are kind of right by um, the ears. And sometimes with trauma being hit by a car or uh, falling out of you know, a fall from a height, we can actually fracture those. Um, so with head trauma, it's not just um, the vestibular system or excuse me, the vestibular signs um, that, that I care about. I also care about things like level of consciousness. I care about other cranial nerve signs. I care about ability to ambulate. Um, it looks like he's at least able to stand here. Um, so uh, I can't give you know, a diagnosis just by looking at this, um, but from what I can tell, we look alert. We look like a peripheral localization. Um, further testing is warranted if you haven't proceeded with it already. Um, sometimes a CAT scan in, in this case can actually show um, and I know I just spent a whole lot of time saying um, how CAT scans aren't, aren't the best thing for evaluating the vestibular system. Um, sometimes if we're worried about a fracture, it can show up on a CT. So had I done an MRI on your pet, I may have also done a CAT scan if the MRI didn't show it. Um, I did sort of pause after I said, you know, further testing is warranted. Some of that answer depends on what's happening now that it's Friday. You know, if this happened on Monday and we're getting better, you know, so maybe on Monday we were, we were rolling and couldn't get up, but now we're able to stand, you know, and on Monday we're able to take a few steps. Um, those are things that if we truly know, hey, we were, here's the history, we were completely normal, we were hit by a car, and we have a strong feeling that this is all due to trauma, this would be a time that maybe I wouldn't um, proceed with a, an MRI but a lot of that answer depends on, are we getting better, worse, staying the same? When did it happen? Um, what are the other exam findings? So um, I hope that's useful. I, I know it's not a um, complete answer of, hey, this is exactly what to do, but um, there are some limitations of what I can do and what I'm uh, allowed to do through um, videography. So the, the take home points, um, lots of things can cause the exact same symptoms. Um, some get better, some get worse. By being evaluated, getting an examination, localizing whether it's central or peripheral, we're much better able to say, well, what are the possible causes? Um, what tests are necessary? And come to a diagnosis so that we can know what the cause is and we can have a appropriate treatment plan and give you an accurate prognosis um, or likelihood of getting better. Um, I hope that was useful. Um, did any new questions come in that, um, let's do this. We have one that is, what is the dose of metronidazole that can affect the patient? Uh, great, great question. So um, going back to metronidazole toxicity, the question is, what is the dose of metronidazole that can affect uh, that can cause central vestibular signs or can cause vestibular disease. Um, so the reported toxic dose is 60 mg per kg. Um, most of the time, um, veterinarians are using much lower doses than that, you know, kind of in the, the 10 to 15 mg per kg range. Um, but metronidazole toxicity can happen at doses lower than that toxic dose. Um, I see dogs with metronidazole toxicity that have been on metronidazole for months. 
Um, I see dogs that get metronidazole toxicity that have been on it just for a couple days. Um, I see dogs that are on whopping doses that um, their symptoms aren't that dramatic. And I see dogs that are on appropriate doses that still get metronidazole toxicity. So um, I guess from a, a veterinarian standpoint, you know, we should try and stick to the, the published doses or the recommended doses. Um, and the other thing from a vet standpoint is if you have a dog with vestibular disease um, that you localize central or many times actually dogs with met metronidazole toxicity, your exam is kind of like, what the heck, this doesn't make sense. You know, um, dog just you know, kind of crouches low to the ground. Sometimes it can be rolling. Um, many times the nystagmus isn't, you know, a, a rapid um, jerk in one direction. It kind of is just more of a flutter. Um, but it should be on our radar whenever we have a dog with um, vestibular disease, just that should be one of the questions that we're always asking. And if that dog's on metronidazole, even if it isn't a whopping dose, it still is worthwhile as part of our um, diagnostic and treatment plan to say, well, maybe we should treat for metronidazole toxicity and see if we improve. Um, the treatment for metronidazole toxicity, one is time, but two is diazepam. Um, there was a nice study, I want to say in like 2003, that looked at um, dogs that had metronidazole toxicity that they treated just with time and ones that they treated with Valium. Um, I believe the the regimen was an initial IV dose of a half mig per kg and then 0.4 migs per kg three times a day. I do a little lower doses than that, um, kind of a half mig per kg to start off and then 0.3 migs per kg three times a day. Um, but the time to ambulation was much faster. Forgive me if I'm a little off on my, um, my, my recollection, but I, I believe um, time to improvement um, without Valium was like seven days and time to improvement with Valium was just over 24 hours. And then time to resolution um, without metric, excuse me, without Valium um, was I think like 14 days um, and with Valium was less than three days. So um, forgive me if I've got those numbers um, messed up a little bit. The, the, the take home point should be treatment for metronidazole toxicity is getting rid of metronidazole um, treatment with Valium at a half mig per kg um, to 0.3 mg per kg three times a day. And you get better much faster with Valium than without it. We have Oscar who says, thanks for the lecture. Hey, Oscar. Uh, do you think the brain atrophy or ventricular megaly have any relation with the old dog vestibular disease? He sees a lot of dogs with old dog vestibular disease and brain atrophy. Um, so the, the question um, is, do I think there's a correlation between um, brain atrophy and, uh, and old dog vestibular disease? Are we talking specifically that? Um, and is he saying cortical atrophy or just generalized brain atrophy? Um, so I, I guess the short answer is no, I, I don't usually correlate the two. Sure, we're seeing older dogs, which um, they are more likely to have atrophy of the brain, but um, I guess I don't necessarily correlate um, or am more likely to diagnose idiopathic old dog vestibular disease if there's cortical atrophy versus not. If the cortical atrophy is severe, um, I actually start thinking of things other than old dog vestibular disease. Um, are there other metabolic or degenerative uh, diseases going on? That's it. Any last minute questions? What time is it? All right, well, thank you all for attending. I hope you learned something. I hope you got some use out of it. Um, shameless plug time? No. Uh, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, um, if you don't see us on all of those places. And we do put little bits of different stuff on on each of them, um, and uh, also on LinkedIn and, and TikTok. Uh, we've got some stuff up there for your learning and uh, 
for entertainment. There's a webinar. There's a webinar coming up. I'm giving a webinar on January 24th, 28th um, at sometime. It will be on our website, excuse me, it will be on our Facebook page. Um, and I'll be talking about spinal cord disease beyond intervertebral disc disease. Um, veterinarians sign up and you'll get uh, one credit, two credits, one credit of race approved CE. Thanks guys, have a great weekend.